anyway. So, so we'll have that a couple more weeks off from there, but we will still be meeting every Sunday morning and all that good fun stuff. But, uh, so we have Christmas Eve over with, Christmas Day over with, we have New Year's Eve coming, going into a new year, which is going to be great. It's not going to be like the last two. It's going to be good. Um, I don't know if much of anything else at the moment other than the youth deal coming up February 26th. Again, that'll be great. Get with Chris. He will help you with that. Whatever you need, he'll let you know. He'll give you all the information. And the point said is, people who have them, pick them up, please. And Tommy has six that he does not want to take home, so there's six that will be available to whoever may want them. So, but please get your... And three more. Oh, so nine will be free to whoever wants them. There's nine free to whoever wants them. So if you got a bunch of cats you don't like, just take them. <laughs> <laughs> That's my understanding. Cats, boys, Mr. Cats. Anyway, I just want to let you know there's some people that may not know that. Anyway, but now I don't have any more announcements, so. But again, I'm thankful to see everybody here. Just disregard my last remark. <laughs> if you're a cat lover. Oh, I love cats. I just let you know. But it's always just cats. <laughs> oh, well, But all right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I come to you today, and I thank you, Lord, for each person that's here. I thank you, Lord, for what we have just celebrated, with Jesus Christ coming into this world and the amazing blessings that come through him. And why, as the sermon title for this Sunday, is joyful to be signed, sealed, and delivered. We have that because of Christ. We have many blessings because of him. And I thank you for that. I thank you, Jesus, for coming into this world and suffering for us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, let's turn to page 118. 
turn back to page 83. Page 83.
than, than the presents cost. So I put that, I just give them money so they can buy what they want. But sometimes our presents come from far away. Now the wise men came a long, long ways to bring Jesus his presents. Did they just hop in their car and drive to where Jesus was? They walked. Now let me ask you this, how did they find Jesus? What was in the sky? A star. They followed the star, didn't they? And the star led them to baby Jesus. Now, sometimes in our in our storybooks and the movies, we see that the wise men are riding camels. And Pastor Luke, I tried to find a scripture that said they rode camels. Is that just something we assume? Okay, we just assume because I know that wise men were very, very important. And I know back then that they rode camels, so we're just... I mean, the uh, kings rode camels, so we're just assuming that they rode camels. But I couldn't find that in the Bible. But we know that they came from afar. They came far, far, far to see baby Jesus. Now, boys and girls, even though the wise men brought baby Jesus great gifts, those gifts were not the greatest gift that was ever given in our time. Baby Jesus. Jesus is the greatest gift that we have ever been given. God knew that we would need help getting to heaven. And he sent his only son. Do you think God loved Jesus? Yes. yes. He only had one son, but he sent him down here to teach us how to live and to help us find a way to get to heaven. And so he is the greatest gift that's ever been given. So boys and girls, should we just remember the greatest gift ever, which is who? Jesus. Should we just remember him at Christmas time? I want you to remember him all the time. We should think of Jesus all the time and thank him for what he's done for us. So let's pray right now and thank God for sending his son Jesus to us. Father God, we just thank you um, that you love us. Father, we are so undeserving of all that you do for us. Lord, we thank you that you gave us the greatest gift ever, and that is your one and only Son, Jesus. We thank you for that you loved us enough to send him to teach us and to lead us, Father, and to die for us. Father, I just thank you for these kids that are here this morning. And Father, I pray that one day they will come to know you and have that relationship with you, Lord. We talked about heaven today in class. Lord, and these little minds are thinking, they're wondering, and they're questioning. And I just thank you, Father, for touching their hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
And I'm going to read it while everything is slowly working here. But in Ephesians 1, 1 through 14, we see, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespass according to the riches of his grace. Which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Making known to us the mystery of his will. According to his purpose which he set forth in Christ. As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise. Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. In this passage, we see an amazing display and work of the Lord, of the Trinity, of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We see all three of them in this text. Many people miss that. But we see them working. What we see here, and we see Paul breaking out in praise of what they've done. All three of them. What all three have done. We see in verses 5 through 6, the Father and his amazing work for us. We see in verses 10 through 12, Christ and our inheritance through him and what he has done by our belief in him. And in 13 through 14, we see the Holy Spirit and His work in sealing and guaranteeing our inheritance with the Father. So what we see here is true, amazing blessings of which we should be thankful for. We see what our amazing God has done for us who are in Christ. If you're in Christ, you are His. And this offer is saving for all who are not in Christ. But the world wants you to look at other things. The world wants you to look at what the world offers. The world offers nothing, as we'll see in a minute. But right here first, I want us to look at the Father's work in verses 1 through 6. What amazing love we see right here. I mean amazing love, amazing giftedness, amazing blessings for all who are in Christ. See, we're all saints in Christ. We're the elect. I believe the church is the elect. What is in Christ is the elect. The predestined, those who have been predestined for the blessings and giftings of the Lord. That is, all of us who are in Christ. And we need to remember that. We need to remember that we are adopted into the family of God. We are blessed beyond measure. We're so it's so much more in Christ than we can even fathom. We can't even comprehend all the blessings we have that we see that we're seated with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We're seated already in the heavenly places of what we see in this text. That is an amazing blessing. That's a guarantee that we're there. But not only that, but we are blessed by the Father who's made many other blessings available to us, and it's because of Christ that we have those. See, these blessings we have, what we can be blessed in the spiritual realm, how we can be 
comfortable in all situations going on is because of the gift of the Spirit who has been given to us. The Holy Spirit. Paul tells us in another scripture, 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. This is the best gift that we can receive next to our everlasting life. That is the best gift we can have next to life eternal with the Lord. And the reason being for that is because we have power. We have ability to overcome. We have joy and heartache. We have happiness and suffering. We have pleasure in unpleasurable circumstances because of the Spirit. And if the Spirit is working for us, if He is moving for us, if He is guiding us and directing us and making us able to have all of that regardless of what is going on, then why do we feel that there's other things out there that we need rather than that? And there's a problem with this. See, this does not mean we have health and wealth and prosperity. What it means is we have this. We have the power, we have the love, and we have self-control. See, there's a false teaching out there that America has been pushing out for a long time. And it says if you only have enough faith, you will no longer have cancer. If you only have faith, you will have money. If you only have faith, nothing will take you down. You'll no longer have miscarriages. You'll no longer lose this. You will have more money than you can imagine. It's a bunch of crap that they're pushing. And they're trying to tell you that. The blessings we have are in heavenly places. We have received everlasting life in Jesus Christ. Love, self-control. When you're desiring the things of the world, that's not self-control. When you're desiring things of the world, that's not love. Blessings in the heavenly places means we're looking, looking for eternal, not here. See, these false teachers will say to people who wind up dying of cancer or losing babies or all of these things, well, you just didn't have enough faith or you didn't send me enough money. See, if you'd have sent me a thousand dollars, you'd have been blessed a hundredfold. You'd have got a hundred thousand. But you didn't do it. That's what they say. That's what they teach. And that's caused many people to leave the faith. Caused many people to hate God. Because they're not looking at the spiritual blessings we have. They're looking to the world. See, God has blessed us so much more above what this world can give you. Why do we want to keep looking at that? See, the prosperity gospel that so many people take, this destroys it, and many other scriptures do too, but that prosperity gospel that so many people here in America are pushing, that's why I encourage you to watch the movie, the documentary, American Gospel, because it calls them out, you will be able to spot the ones that it is. There's some that are so good at hiding it, it's unreal. But people have walked away from the faith because they didn't receive all these things. They cursed God. They've become ardent atheists that are out there well knowledge in the Bible enough to do, debate with people and convince others that God is not real. Because people like these have abused Scripture and taken Scripture out of context and said, well, right here it says, I know the plans for you. Well, prosper. That's to Israel. While they were in bondage, God has a plan for them in that respect. That's not to us. And even if it is, the way people pull it, they pull it out of content and try to apply it. Jesus, what did he tell people when they come to him? For the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, yet you still want to follow me. Paul, Peter, James, John, all of them, they didn't have anything. The healing of the man at the gate. Peter and John walking in. The guy looked at him. And they said, well, look at me. And the guy expected alms, as it says in Scripture. But Peter says, silver and gold, I have none. But what I have, I give you. Rise and walk. 
He didn't have money. It wasn't money. And it wasn't that guy's faith. It was the faith of Peter. Not that man. That man was expecting money. It's the spiritual blessings. The blessings in the heavenly places that is what has given us strength. The blessings we have from God are not here, but they're heavenly. They're sitting at the right hand of God the Father in Jesus Christ. Right now. That's where it's at. And that means that no matter where you are in the world, whether you're in a mansion, you're under an overpass, you're in prison, you're wherever you may be, that you're just as good as already seated with Jesus Christ. As long as you're his. That is true prosperity. That is the true message of God's blessing. It's not monetary or worldly. And anyone that tells you that is wrong and deceitful. If we were all meant to be healthy and wealthy in Christ, there would not be a sick person in this room. There would not be a poor person in this room. Everybody in here would be multi-million. Everybody in here would have perfect, pure health. Guess what? In eternity, we will. But not right here. That is our spiritual blessings. That is our blessings in the heavenly places. Our blessings here, what we're to be, is set apart and holy before the Lord and not like the world. See, if we're chasing this prosperity gospel, if we're chasing this money, if we're chasing this worldly wealth, we're not set apart and holy. We're the world. We're not being a blessing to others. And we're not enjoying our spiritual blessings. So this prosperity gospel pushed by so many false teachers, they want you to ignore what God has said and listen to what they say. I know another one just like that. Did God really say? Did he really say that if you eat of this fruit? No, God don't want you eating of that fruit because you're going to become just like him. Did God really say? That's the question we need to always ask when we hear people saying things like this. And they don't care about you. They don't care about anything else. They just want that money, money, money. Just like an East Man and Dan. All they want is dollar, dollar bills, y'all. That's all they want. That's all they want. They don't care about your soul. They don't care about your wealth. They don't care about your health. But I know one who does. And I know who is going to give you the ultimate healing. In him, that is Jesus Christ. We see this. See, God has called us out to be holy and different. We, when we're in Christ, God sees his righteousness on us. He sees perfection. He sees us through the lens of Jesus Christ. That's what we see in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It says, for our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is the blessing. That is is what we need and want and desire. So, what more do you want? Why would you want more? I mean, Christmas is a time to celebrate Jesus Christ. But too often, we have a tendency to want more, to see more, desire more, rather than what it's all about. What we need to realize is adoption into the family. Just like a child that is to be adopted. What do they want? They want a family. They don't care about where or what. They want a family who is going to love them. They don't care if that family is a millionaire. They don't care any of that. They want a family to love them. Well, us, in Christ, we're adopted into the most loving family imaginable. God the Father, Christ Jesus, the Holy Spirit, they are ours. We have joy and happiness, and we will have glory in eternity through that. We're adopted. That's the greatest blessing imaginable. Worldly blessings, who cares? Worldly things, who cares? Let's be like that adopted child that is looking at this family that is coming to adopt them. They see the family. They see the love. They see the compassion. They see the care. They see the joy in that. Nothing else. Nothing else. If you're in Christ, you are adopted into the family. 
So all the stuff that we have, all the things that are ours right now, let's be like Paul right here in Philippians 3, 7 through 8. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. That is our blessing. And that is what the Father has done for us. He has delivered us. He has sealed us. He has seated us in the heavenly places. Why do we care about monetary and worldly things? Because all they do is aggravate you anyway. Because it don't work right. It causes you grief and frustration. That's all it does. Look at the world. If, if you want something that you can't buy, what happens? You get cranky. If you have something and somebody takes it, what happens? You get mad. You know, Christ was speaking of some of this stuff whenever he was telling the disciples that if somebody takes your cloak, give them your robe also. Someone asks you to go a mile, go two miles. Don't let the worldly things control you. You control the worldly things by being seated in the different places. But not only do we see this, but we see the Son's work. In Christ we have redemption. It says here, we have redemption through his blood. That means we have acquittal. The state of being redeemed through his sacrifice. It's because of him. Why we have anything. It's nothing else. It's all him. He did it so we could be with him. That's amazing. He did it so we could be with him. We've gone over it so many times what he did. His coming, suffering, dying, all of this for us. For us. I wouldn't die for myself. I know the kind of person I am. I wouldn't die for me. But Jesus did. I want you to take a good, hard self-examination. Would you be willing to die for your own self? If you were someone else looking at you, would you be willing? Jesus died for you. So you can have redemption. That is a blessing. Because of what Christ did in his death, burial, and resurrection, we struggle with this. Because of that, we don't have a sin problem. We have a son problem. And Lewis Barry Schaefer, a very prominent theologian, once said, because of Calvary, people no longer have a sin problem. Instead, they have a son problem. Christ has come to redeem all sin. His death cleanses all sin. 1 John 2 tells us that he is a propitiation for all the world. John tells us in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, the Son of God, the Lamb of God has come to take away the sins of the whole world. We don't have a sin problem. We have a son problem. He's come to give us redemption. But we still see the world. and want the world. We want when we can have the most. Somebody has the 50 cent piece right now they're willing to give you, but if you wait till tomorrow, they'll give you a whole dollar. Then you have the option to take the 50 cents now or the dollar tomorrow. So many people say that, I can still make it 50 cents rather than waiting for the dollar. The world is the 50 cent piece. You only get half the picture. The Lord is the whole picture, and he has offered it to all of us. That is the grace of God that we can be thankful for. This is what Christ has come to do. He's come to deliver us from our iniquity and our evilness. We're all evil. You may not see yourself as evil. But the Bible clearly tells us that for all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. The way to the sin is death. But I turn with Jesus Christ. We're all evil. You can be the best person in the world. You can give all your money away, do all these great things for people. But if you've not believed in Jesus Christ, you must spend eternity in hell. That's why we have a son problem. He came to give us redemption. Just as we saw in the Christmas Eve message, all who were here for that. God had a plan for this to all happen. And he made it. He made good with that plan. In accordance to his will, it all happened. He's poured out all abundant riches to us in grace. And God's desire, remember, is that all be saved and come to full knowledge of the truth. 
All of these things. That's his desire. Christ has made good on that. But we still have a tendency to look to the world. We have that inheritance in Christ. We have full inheritance in Christ. It's not like things here to where you may have five or six brothers and sisters and each one of you inherit whatever it is. In God, in Christ, we have full inheritance. You get every spiritual blessing. Every bit of it. This world can't match it. This world cannot do it. But we still seek after worldly items that are of no value. But we do it. But why? Could we still struggle with worldly problems? Is it not? We still have bills to pay. We have vehicles that break down. Water heaters that go out. Washer and dryers. Refrigerators. We get sick. We need money. We need all that. But we get too caught up in that rather than resting in the Lord and trusting Him to provide. He sent Christ to die. He's done all of that for us. Why do we not think he'll provide otherwise? We need to resign ourselves to the fact that not all blessings, not all things in this world are meant for us to have. We get to think in plenty, you know, this is a necessity. Is it really? Do we absolutely 100% have to have a washer and dryer to live? Do we absolutely 100% have to have a water heater to live. No. No. I spent several years living in Winthorpe, Texas, and we were all too broke to do all kinds of things. I had three or four different guys living there. We couldn't afford nothing. We'd run out of propane left and right. We were constantly boiling water so we could take a hot bath. You can boil water. I did it for years. If we go back to they were in 1800, just take a bath once a month. We'd all be used to each other, I promise. All them wagons out there, everybody stinks. Nobody knows it. You get used to each other. Just don't be the first one to take a bite. Bad. But we have blessings in the Lord. We have treasure in heaven. Christ told us in Matthew 6, 20 through 21, but lay for yourselves treasures in heaven when neither moth nor rust destroys, nor thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Is our treasure in the spiritual blessings, or is it here? I want you to think on that. That's our full inheritance. That is what we are. That is where we are. We're already seated there. Yes, it's nice to have nice comforts here. But there's many people who have none of them. And they have more joy than the wealthiest Christian in America. You look at people in some of these third world countries that have nothing. They're thankful to have a stick shack. They're meeting in churches with no roof. They're meeting in churches with no walls. They're meeting in the open air. And they're there. And they're staying there for two or three hours because they can't get enough of Jesus Christ. But we want the nicest in America. And it's because of that false American gospel. That false prosperity gospel that is crept in. The American dream has crept into the church. In the church, we should be heavenly dreamed, not American dreamed. If a gospel can't preach in a third world country, it's not the gospel. So you take that prosperity gospel to those people who are being killed, who are being martyred for their faith, but they're still going to church just as what happened in Afghanistan not too long ago, the underground church, because of the withdrawal that happened, there were many of them martyred, but they kept meeting anyway because people's souls are more important than their own life. That is the gospel. That is people that are focused on the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. That is the focus on the deliverance Christ has brought for us. That's where we should be focused. Where all of us should be focused. Because of these beautiful blessings. We don't deserve salvation. Yet we received it. We don't deserve this inheritance. Yet we received it. We don't deserve this redemption. Yet we received it. We don't deserve anything except severe punishment. That's the beauty of grace. Grace has given us what we don't deserve. 
when we deserve God's judgment and wrath. That's the beauty of grace. That's the beauty of our heavenly blessings. That's the beauty of our spiritual blessings. And along with all of that, along with all of that, we see the Spirit's work. The 13 through 14. The Spirit seals us into the family. We're locked in and we cannot lose this. We're in, we see it in our inheritance and in our seating in the heavenly places. We're there. We're locked in. But down here, we see it very clear. We see that the Spirit guarantees our inheritance until we acquire the possession. That acquire is the same word as redemption. But in this context, it has a little different meaning. It means that we're God's now. We're His property. This guarantee is like the earnest money you put down on a house. Where it's there, there's a guarantee that you're going to go ahead. That's the first installment, the deposit, the down payment, the giving of all of this, where it obligates you to continue to make the payment. It's a guarantee. And in the old times, when this was wrote, back when that was going on, there was no change of that. You could not break it, as we have now. Today, we make loopholes because we, the people, love loopholes. So we make loopholes all the time for things. But in the cultural setting of this, the guarantee of that meant it was something that could not be broken. And that is awesome because that is part of our spiritual blessing. That is part of what we have in Christ is a guarantee. We're going to acquire this inheritance. Nothing can separate us. Nothing can stop it. And this world, no matter what they throw at us, no matter what they try to do, cannot stop it. That's what Paul says in Romans 8. Are you willing for that? Are you okay with that? If everything was taken from you now, then Jesus Christ, would you still say, praise the Lord? The Lord is given and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. As Job said, after he lost everything, are we so caught up on earthly stuff that we miss the true joy for the world, what true prosperity is, that it's in Jesus Christ? Have we missed that? Are we looking at this inheritance that is guaranteed, or are we looking at the world? Socrates once said, how can you call a man free when his pleasures rule over him. See, the thing is, in the world, we're looking at stuff, and we let the pleasures of the world rule us. Are you free? We're in America. It's supposed to be this free country, but are we free? Are we? If we're letting that stuff rule over us, rather than Jesus Christ, are we free? We're not. We're bound by legalism. That's a new legalism. But if you just have enough faith, well, if you didn't get it, you didn't have enough faith. That's a new legalism. It's putting pressures on people that are not in Scripture. It is forcing people into a mold that's not there. That's not what Christ came in this world for. That is not what Christ came here and suffered and died for. He came for freedom. Christ has set you free. We're free in Christ if we embrace these amazing, Heaven, blessings that are ours right now. Are you embracing that? See, the things of the world are transient. They don't stick around. The true and lasting values are spiritual in nature. <laughs> true and lasting values are spiritual in nature. Are you trusting in the world? Or are you trusting in spiritual guidance? spiritual strength, Jesus Christ, the heavenly blessings, the seated in the heavenly places? Or are you trusting in your job? But trust in the Lord. It's what he came for. It's what Christmas is all about. It's trust in the Lord. And if you have not, I pray that today that you will, that you will rest in the Lord, that you will let rest in these lasting promises of his. Because in Calvary, people no longer have a sin problem. They have a son problem. Do you have a son problem? Or are you seated in the heavenly blessings of him?
That's where our true blessings are. Let's pray. Father, I come to you and I thank you for this day. Thank you for each person here. I praise you for your amazing blessings you have given us, your amazing grace, your amazing love. Lord, I can't thank you enough for all of that. And I pray to you, Lord, that each person in this room will rest in you in all things. Rest in your blessing of them, the heavenly blessings, the gifts you have given that are so much more important than any gift this world can ever offer. Lord, I pray for each person in this room. Lord, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for everything you do for us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.